I'm pleased to uh, introduce you to our first speaker of the day. First speaker is one of uh, is the other co-organizers, Samuel Kuipers. Uh, Samuel is a DPhil student at the Department of Physics at the University of Oxford. He's interested in the many worlds interpretation and developing the Heisenberg picture formulation of quantum theory. Sam, I'm very looking forward to your talk. Enjoy. Great, thanks so much. And thanks everyone for being here. Um, I want to present some work I've been doing on uh, the page Rudis model of quantum theory. These are some uh, ideas that I'm still developing. So hence I have caught the talk musings on the quantum theory of time. And uh, I wanted to start off the, uh, the talk with this quote that I was reminded of in this research by Feynman, where he says that our understanding of the universe is just as mysterious. Sorry, I need to actually remove this bar to be able to see my presentation. Is that our understanding of the universe is just as mysterious, just as awe-inspiring, and just as incomplete as the poetic pictures that came before. And uh, the page Rudis model definitely reminded me of this fact, this kind of open-endedness of science. Um, now, the, uh, the starting point of my discussion will be uh, this idea that quantum theory, as David Wallace said yesterday, is a kind of a collection of theories held together by what I will call the fundamental principle of quantum theory, which is that the descriptors of physical systems are Q numbers. For example, uh, the momentum and position of a point part particle are canonically conjugate operators. The descriptors of a qubit adhere to the Pauli algebra. The descriptors of fermions are Grassmann operators, etc. And, and each quantum theory has um, such a set of descriptors, such a set of Q-number descriptors. In a sense, I guess I'm distinguishing myself. Like, uh, I'm not taking the approach of Sean Carroll, who wants to start with just the wave function. I, I take the descriptors as being fundamental. And it's from them that you kind of arrive at a Hilbert space and other concepts. And it's because of uh, this assumption that time has a rather peculiar status within quantum theory as it's represented by a C number, meaning that it's not an attribute of any physical system. Uh, in fact, it, it kind of plays this role of, a, of an unphysical background against which systems can change. And it reminded me of, of Newton's absolute time in classical mechanics, since each, since both the absolute time and the C number time in quantum theory can be said to of itself and from its own nature flow equitably without regard to anything external. And as Newton points out, it, these, this absolute notion of time uh, is, is different from the relative and apparent and common time that you define through the means of motion. In other words, it's different from time given by clocks and such things, at least that's how I understand Newton here. And uh, this difference is made apparent if you consider it like a hypothetical situation in which uh, the universe as a whole freezes relative to the C number time, such that the C number time kind of still flows equitably without regard to anything external, while there's no movement of physical systems. And uh, such, such a freeze in the universe would be undetectable by an observer because we could only ever observe the, the relative time. Uh, that, that kind of raises the, the possibility that perhaps since the start of this talk and now, uh, millions of years have passed because the C number time kind of flowed forward while we were frozen. Um, hopefully it won't have felt like a million of year, millions of years have passed unless that the talk, but that's maybe a different consideration. Um, so, in other words, the C number time is unphysical. It, it, it isn't characterized by the behavior of any physical system. And uh, we've, we've done away with Newton's absolute time in special relativity and general relativity because there's no sense in which uh, clocks can be uh, synchronized simultaneously, absolutely. There's no absolute simultaneity in that theory. And uh, there's actually a nice argument by Julian Barber that that as I understand him, we didn't really need that uh, to begin with. We could have uh, worked only with the relative time, even in classical mechanics, because we could have defined time as resulting from the, the relative rate of change between a celestial bodies, their, their different positions relative to us. Uh, and in that sense, made time physical. We could have used 
these celestial bodies as a kind of celestial clock. And in fact, I think it, it, celestial bodies were used for that purpose to, to keep track of time. Uh, meaning that in Barber's construction, uh, there is only relative change. Such a on freeze of physical systems doesn't have any meaning. There isn't time. There isn't time in the universe that is unchanging, and the logic that uh, is used there, I think, derives from the Page Wooders construction in quantum theory, where the universe as a whole is assumed to be completely stationary in the sense that the universal state vector is an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. Uh, meaning that no observable quantity in that universe depends on the C number time. And then through the introduction of a so-called quantum clock, phys physical systems can change relative to one another. In particular, they can evolve relative to this clock where clocks have uh, as their kind of characteristic property that they have these two conjugate, canonically conjugate descriptors, H and T. Uh, so that in this universe, which is stationary, you can then consider that part of the universe that isn't a clock or that part of the universe that uh, is relative to, to the clock being in time t. And then from the assumption that the clock is an isolated system, meaning that the Hamiltonian of the universe is the Hamiltonian of the rest of the universe plus the Hamiltonian of the clock, which is assumed to be this operator h. Oh, I should actually, I think I forgot to say so these operators h and t h uh, first of all t is the time observable of the clock meaning that the different eigenvalues of t corresponds to different times and h is a kind of a translation operator so it, it translates uh, t forward in time a little bit um, and in page Wooders construction it plays the role of the hamiltonian which which i've expressed here in this equation uh, where the hamiltonian of the universe as a whole is a the sum of the of the Hamiltonian of the rest of the universe and the uh, Hamiltonian of the clock. And then from these assumptions, it follows that the rest of the universe evolves according to the Schrodinger equation uh, relative to the different times denoted on the clock. And that, that can kind of be nicely summarized in a way that makes apparent its connection to Everett's interpretation by uh, representing the universal state vector as this integral over the different relative states so each uh, psi of t here is the state of the universe relative to a particular time t. And although the universe is a whole stationary, these relative states appear to change. It's also why, as I believe Deutsch pointed out in his book, Fabric of Reality, uh, that the different times are, are exactly like different universes in Everett's construction. So I think that this is a beautiful model and yet it, it leaves open uh, the possibility that the C number time still plays an explanatory role in the Heisenberg picture, because the constraint that the universal state vector is stationary doesn't translate nicely to uh, the Heisenberg picture, I think. And the reason for this is as follows. If you consider a qubit uh, in the Heisenberg picture, which is represented by a triple of time dependent Q number descriptors, which adhere to the Pauli algebra, um, and you suppose that the qubit evolves, uh, well, is isolated and evolves unitarily, then uh, it must evolve according to this equation where H of Q is the Hamiltonian of the qubit. And if we now impose uh, what appears to be the equivalent of the page Wooders construction uh, requirement that the state vector is an eigenstate of the, the Hamiltonian, then uh, we, we see that no expectation value of this qubit depends on this C number T, the C number time T, and yet the qubit's descriptors do depend on that time coordinate provided that the Hamiltonian isn't equal to zero. In other words, uh, what Paul would call the nominal state of the system depends on this C number time T, while the uh, the actual observable quantities don't. And I think that this isn't quite enough to give you a Heisenberg picture uh, solution for the, the C number time. Uh, and, and this is problematic for those of us who like the Heisenberg picture because we think that the Heisenberg picture is, is fundamental and that, uh, for example, it's the only local description of quantum theory as, as Paul pointed out in his talk on Wednesday. Um, and 
that would mean, for example, like maybe if, if the Heisenberg page doesn't allow us to formulate the page reduce construction in a satisfactory manner, then perhaps the, the Heisenberg page just can't describe the universe as a whole. Maybe it, there's some mistake or some flaw of it that makes it just inferior to the Schrodinger picture, makes it less fundamental. And uh, I want to defend the, the Heisenberg picture against that claim and, and show that within the Heisenberg picture, you can uh, also formulate the page reader construction without need for the C number time. Oh. And this, this brings me to kind of a related issue, which is that um, I, I think that the Q numbers are really the fundamental entities of quantum theory. And it, uh, you, you might call me a Q number purist or something. I, I want to really start with th these Q numbers and from them derive C numbers. And it seems like we're, we're kind of bound to, we, we are tied to using C numbers because if we want to formulate equations of motion, then uh, we always refer back to, to C numbers. We don't know what it means to have equations of motion in terms of, of Q numbers. What, what is a derivative with respect to a Q number? And uh, this is something that kind of strikes me as, as unsatisfactory that uh, these Q numbers cannot in some sense be interpreted or, or regarded as fundamental because we always rely on, on some kind of underlying C number parameterization of a system's dynamics. Uh, so kind of drawing on an idea from Dirac, uh, in fact, Charles showed me this paper recently. Um, Dirac in 1926, uh, in a paper I believe is called On Quantum Mechanics and a Preliminary Investigation into the Hydrogen Atom. Uh, proposed this idea of a Q number function, where he says, if we, if we have a Q number Z, then a Q number function, we might consider some polynomial of Z, Z of N. And he then defines derivatives with respect to these functions, uh, just as, oh, the power, what the power series would be if the function, if the Q number was a C number. And although I think, again, this is a nice idea, it, it kind of, it isn't really fundamental because for one thing, this Q number is supposed to represent a physical system and some change occurring to a physical system. And that's not being taken account of here. Uh, the, the, we're just saying that the derivative is equal to what we expect it to be in the C number case. We're kind of working by analogy. And we're not referring to, for example, the algebra of the system in question. And we're not saying what the physical system really is. Uh, so. I want to kind of flesh out what we might mean with a Q number function. Also, Dirac is only considering polynomials of Z. And, and I want to consider a larger class of functions. And, and to that end, I want to uh, circle back to the page reader's construction and present some of it in the Heisenberg picture, where uh, first of all, we have, we have a clock system. We're assuming that there is a clock and that this clock is described by Q numbers T and H, and that the different Q number values of these descriptors T and H correspond to different states of the clock. And the different values of T and H are restricted uh, by certain constitutive attributes of the clock. One of them is that at any point in time, the clock needs to have these two uh, canonically conjugate Q numbers, Q number descriptors T and H, so that any change of the Q numbers needs to be unitary. Uh, also, the uh, operator, the Q number H, is assumed to be fixed for all states of the clock. And the clock is supposed to be an isolated system. So all changes must be written in terms of H, and all unitaries must be functions of H and T. Meaning that we have this kind of set of states that I've denoted as T, for which um, the observable or the, the Q number T is varied unitarily. And it turns out that these unitary transformations ends up these, these unitary transformations that represent physical changes in the clock are uh, shifts of some initial Q number T zero plus uh, some factor alpha times the identity. And I should also add that this is the set of kind of counterfactual states that the clock can be in. It's, there's no sense of dynamics 
I'm not talking about the clock having a specific history. These are the states that the clock could be in regardless of its dynamics in history. And then in terms of these uh, Q numbers, T in the set, big T, uh, can be defined as polynomials or convergent series. So we have a, a Q number function of T as a polynomial or convergent series with C number coefficients. Where for those of you who are wondering about the convergence of the series, uh, that has to be defined in terms of, of operator bounds. And there's some kind of subtleties here because the, the Q number T is unbounded. It, it, it's, its operator norm is not finite. Um, and there's ways of getting around that. Uh, but fundamentally, as we'll get to later in the talk, I think all clocks should be finite physical systems and the, uh, the Q numbers that represent the clock will be bounded. So it's, it's always straightforward to define convergence. Um, so that's a class of functions that we can consider. And then from that class of functions, by imposing some history on the clock, by saying that the clock changes in a particular way, we can then define what it means for there to be a derivative of a function such as f of t, where I say that uh, the derivative is defined as the change in the function for an infinitesimal change in the q number t. And uh, kind of magically because, well, of the algebra of the clock, it, it turns out that you can write this in, in terms of the commutator of f of t and h, uh, which I think reminds, it, it looks like a Heisenberg equation of motion, but this equation would have turned out differently if the algebra of the clock had been different. Uh, so there's a nice kind of role that the algebra of the clock plays in this construction. And then uh, from that, we can derive the, the kind of Dirac's rule of thumb for what the uh, Q number derivative should be. It's just an instance of the more general Q number derivative. Um, but we haven't really gotten rid of the, the C number time yet, because each of these functions is still parameterized by some C number. Any change still supposes that there's a history of the clock that is parameterized by some C number. And uh, I think that for the page to be for the page Wooders formalism to be formulated in the Heisenberg picture, what we need to impose is that the descriptors of physical systems are not just Q numbers, but they're Q number functions of the Q number time T. So for example, we can reconsider the, the, the clock, or sorry, the qubit that we considered earlier on in the talk, which again has triples of has a triple of descriptors that adhere to the Pauli algebra. Uh, but now I also impose that they are what I call Q number functions proper of time, where uh, I define these functions as, again, a convergent series or polynomial on T, but with Q number coefficients, which in uh, the bottom of the slide are shown as these A sub Ns. Each of these A sub Ns is its own Q number. In fact, it's a triple of Q number because the uh, Q is a triple of Q number, the bold phase Q is a triple. And uh, also for this definition to make sense, I should impose that these Q number coefficients commute with both the uh, Q number T and the clock's Hamiltonian H. So in a sense, they live on a kind of separate Hilbert space from the observables of the clock. And if one defines, I think if one defines functions in this way, um, then there's a way of getting rid of the C number time altogether by saying or imposing that the Hamiltonian of the universe commutes with this triple of descriptors Q of T such that uh, the, this triple will be completely invariant with regards to translations of the C number time. And consequently, it, it turns out that you get this Heisenberg equation of motion, which depends on only on Q numbers uh, in, in a kind of in a changeless universe. So there's a way of starting with Q numbers as being fundamental and not having to talk about a particular like parameterization of uh, physical systems in terms of C numbers and, and still have equations of motions and things like that, which I, th I think helps uh, the case that for Q numbers being fundamental because we, we can start with only those entities and then derive from them things like C numbers. Now, uh, to get to clocks being 
in perfect or finite physical systems, as I pointed to earlier, there's, there's several uh, problems which I think are like relatively well known. One of them is that the, uh, the Q number H cannot represent a physical Hamiltonian because its spectrum is not bounded from below. So because of the algebra of the uh, clock's descriptors, H uh, cannot be bounded from below. And consequently, we can let the clock relax into its non-existent ground state and retrieve an infinite amount of energy from it. Um, relatedly, the clock is supposed to be ideally accurate in that it has infinitely many distinguishable states, meaning that it has infinitely many eigenstates. Yet for any uh, finite system, we should expect that the information it can store in a compact region of space should be bounded by Bekenstein's bound. And also there's this clock ambiguity uh, that ideal clocks suffer from. So it's not, I think it's not entirely clear whether the, uh, how to put this, it's that if you start with one clock and one, with the partitioning of the universe into a clock into a, a, a rest of the universe, then you can use a unitary transformation to go to another clock and the rest of the universe, which would not be possible in the case where the clocks are finite physical systems, but maybe uh, we can discuss this more. I'm not, I, I think that this is true. I, Chiara and Flacco have written a paper about this and it would be fun to discuss. Um, so I propose that all, in, in fact, all clocks are finite physical systems, finite in the sense that they have a finite dimensional Hilbert space, and that there's not just one clock relative to which all other physical systems evolve. There's, just, there's like an assortment of these imperfect clocks that describe time in a compact region of space. And the fact that there appears to be something like a global time coordinate at all should be due to these imperfect clocks being synchronized with one another. And I think there's quite a nice way of describing when the clocks are synchronized in the Heisenberg picture. It's uh, if you have two clocks, you say, I say that they're synchronized if clock one is in the state, it is time t, if and only if the other clock is also in that state for all times t, meaning that if you have two clocks, uh, C1 and C2 with time observables T1 and T2, then uh, C2 is synchronized to C1 when the relation between their time observables is uh, the one shown at the lower half of the slide, where this Q number A is, uh, represents the relative rate of change between T1 and T2, and B represents the kind of the off offset between the, the two Q numbers. And the clocks are synchronized if the expectation value of A is equal to one and the offset, the expectation value of the offset is equal to um, zero. As in that case, any uh, measurement of Q1 will result in the same outcome as uh, a measurement of Q, of, sorry, of T1 will result in the same outcome of a measurement of T2. And uh, this, it also has the nice feature that derivatives of one of these Q numbers can then be written in terms of the other Q number. And, and this reminded me of a, a manifold where we have these charts from the manifold to uh, some, vect some vector space Rn and where on overlapping regions, uh, the, the charts need to have some kind of transition function. In other words, the, the clocks are kind of like these individual charts which map Q numbers to real numbers. And then there is a transition function which says how we should relate time in one compact region space to time in another compact region space, which is this uh, condition that the clocks are synchronized with one another. And perhaps it's possible to, uh, to obtain more interesting, uh, it's, not yet, it's not quite space time yet because we haven't considered time. Uh, the page Rudis model has been extended to space time by Singh and, and perhaps one way of formulating his uh, construction in the Heisenberg picture is by imposing different conditions for the clocks being able to, uh, to be synchronized with one another. So perhaps it isn't possible to, you know, we expect it not to be possible to absolutely synchronize clocks and, and I think that should be reflected in a more general theory in theory of a Q number space time. And uh, then the, the, I have some musings about quantum gravity, one of them being uh, we have this, if, if we take on board that 
this Heisenberg description is right. I mean, I'm still working on uh, producing the paper, but should it be right? Then one of the questions I have is how, how do we define Q number derivatives in a curved space time? That's, that's not really a question you have in the Schrodinger picture. There's no equivalent to it. It, it only appears when you think about uh, the, what the Q numbers represent in the Heisenberg picture. And then uh, relatedly, because we're all Everettians here, I, I had this uh, thought of, well, if we're Everettians, then we should consider that macroscopic physical systems such as the sun should uh, be described by quantum theory. And in other Everett universes, the sun has different positions. And so uh, it bends space time differently in those other universes. And how would we model that? Like would uh, Singh's construction of a Q number space time be able to model something like this, where there's an interaction between a physical system in uh, a superposition of different positions and the, the Q number space time that it's embedded in. And with that, I'm kind of coming to the conclusion of the talk. And to circle back to Feynman's quote, I was reminded of, so in, in studying the page Rudis model, I was reminded of uh, Parmenides' blocked universe. Uh, Parmenides, according to Popper, was one of the first people, if, if not the first person, to, to think about a stationary blocked universe because he, he studied the kind of waxing and waning of the moon and discovered that it's, uh, I think it used to be thought that the moon was like this spinning disk, uh, whereas Parmenides thought it was the, the light hitting the moon differently at different angles uh, that caused the waxing and waning of the moon. So the, the movement of the moon was kind of illusory. It is, it's not, uh, it's only an empirical fact that it seems to move, but it doesn't really. Um, and I think similarly in, in the page Rudis construction, like movement is not a fundamental or change, change with respect to time is not fundamental. It kind of emerges out of more primitive properties of quantum systems. Uh, so I thought it'd be nice to end the talk with a, a brief kind of poem from Parmenides that what, at one time in much erring sense organs mixture that seems genuine knowledge to men, for they take as the same thing men's intellectual mind and his sense organ, organs very nature. Thought they call what in the model prevails in each man and all. And uh, with that, I end the talk. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much, Sam, for the talk. Everyone can join me for applauses. Wow, great. Um, we have um, 20 minutes for questions. If um, I see a hand rise by uh, somebody who is quite relevant for this talk, Don, if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, okay. Very, yeah, very, very interesting talk. Yeah, that was, that was nice to see. I was just trying to think of generalizations to quantum field theory and quantum gravity. I mean, well, and if it was, if, if first I just have quantum field theory in, in fixed Minkowski space time, then I would expect the state to be well, and and it, it, an eigenstate of energy and momentum and angular momentum and and so on. So it shouldn't, you know, it shouldn't depend on time and it shouldn't depend on on x or y or z. Though of course it could be relative things. But I mean, it's yeah, it's it's. I don't know. That would be interesting. Can one? Uh, yeah, there's a puzzle that I've that I've that, that, that I've sometimes had that, you know, naively I would normally we describe things in terms of quantum fields at, at positions given by c number t x y and z say, uh, but in some sense, but in some sense any state should be equivalent to to any other st state that you just get it by some Poincaré transformation, and so of course it would be nice in some sense to be able to write the states. Uh, the this equivalence class of states is one state, but it I don't know how to do it, and I don't know whether anybody else has has has, has done it in that uh, in that way that it's that, that that somehow you just see the state that it you can see that it doesn't depend on the absolute time or anything. It only you know can only depend on relative uh, times between different relative. Well, the relative intervals, I guess, between the the, the ds squared integral uh, between between different events. But yeah, it would be uh, 
I don't know. It'd be nice to see if one could 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 just do quantum even 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 without gravity, do quantum field theory and get rid of all the C number, all the C number coordinates. And then of course in quantum gravity it gets even harder. I mean, normally of course you 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 have in the in the constraint equations you've got um, sort of functional derivatives of 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 pushing the hypersurfaces forward or or or, or, or changing the well changing the conf how does the wave function depend if you change the if you change the configuration and usually the configuration well in canonical quantum gravity it's you, you know it's the it's the it's the uh, metric well the the metric modulo diffeomorphisms but it's it, it, it's the space time on some on some hypersurface but I don't know it, it seems a little it seems hard to try to uh, describe that without you know, you know that it, you know that in the end, the coordinate it's diffeomorphism invariant. So the coordinates aren't important, but it's hard to sort of get rid of that. And it even relates back to things when when people talk about how gauge symmetry is so important in physics, and indeed it is. But it would seem like if you could have a gauge invariant description of everything, then there would be no gauge symmetry because you you've just taken out the gauge. And so, in, in some absolute sense, there is no gauge symmetry because if you describe it without that. And so what does it mean when we say, I mean, I'm, I'm really going off on a tangent, but it, it really seems to, uh, it, to say, what do we mean by saying that, that, that gauge symmetry is, in, is important? I mean, it, it just, it seems to us humans, it's simpler to describe things in terms of gauge non-invariant things like, like having coordinates in general relativity or like having a particular gauge in electromagnetism, but then the ultimate the ultimate physics is in, is invariant from that, and the ultimate physics doesn't seem to have the gauge invariant. So, what what is it? Is there some absolute sense in which there's any gauge in in invariance? Anyway, okay. They, sorry, th this is just some musings I have on related issues. But very nice. Yeah, I, I don't uh, I don't know. Um, I, I I I share your questions basically. I, I don't know any of the answers to them. All right. If you want, we can move on with another question. I see Wallace, uh, David Wallace has his hand raised. David, would you like to ask your question? Sure. I'm, I'm wondering about the relation back to the original page, which is view. Um, I mean, I said you see the yeah. problem you're raising. I mean, the page, which is um, result is clearly state dependent. So it, we're, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a much more strong constraint to do that in Heisenberg picture. Um, and the construction you've put together is fascinating but um what wasn't clear to me was whether it in some sense recovers the yes the, because we, we sort of know the page which version works um we we yeah. you know, modular however we know these, these things so i mean we we can recover you know effective dynamics of the right sort in this framework and i, I don't i don't really have a sufficiently clear picture of how much this recovers the page water framework rather than sort of you know, being inspired of by it and going off in a different direction. Yes. Um, as I said, so I'm currently writing a paper on this and that's one of the issues I'm uh, working on. It's, it's interesting that you should ask the question because what I think happens is that you have to have additional constraints on the Heisenberg state that are provided by a wall Stimson transformation. That's how it seems to me at the moment. So you have uh, different if you consider the universe as being described by like a triple of Q numbers that are functions of T, so this mm. is a, a universe with a, a qubit and it's a function of T, and uh, there's the, let me see, there's the Hamiltonian of the clock and that, that fully describes, well, there's the Hamiltonian of the whole universe and that fully describes your page Wooders model with, if you're also provided a, a Heisenberg state that like, like specifies all of it. Now, if you could, Perform a Wall Stimson transformation that maps that page Wooders universe in the Heisenberg picture onto another page Wooders universe, which is stationary in the sense that it doesn't depend on this, not even on this uh, Q number time t, then uh, that that would result in the universe being like kind of trivially stationary. Mm -hmm. There's no sense in which it evolves, and that puts a constraint on the Heisenberg state because. So there should be certain state, you should have a Heisenberg state that doesn't allow you to perform that wall of Stimson transformation. And I think that constraint, uh, which I'm still understanding uh, in the business, like, I'm still working on understanding it better, but 
Mm. I think that constraint gives you back the same constraint as you would have in the Schrodinger picture. So in fact, the, the models map one to one to each other. Right. So if you have a Schrodinger picture model, then you can always write it in terms of the Heisen, this Heisenberg picture model that mm. I show here, and you can also go back. Okay, great, thank you. We'll just look at that. Thank you for the question. Thanks. Another hand raised was by uh, Siddharth. Siddharth, would you like to ask a question? Thanks, yeah. Um, my question is uh, about the motivation of this uh, project. And, and I find the project pretty interesting, but just to step back a bit, right? So if you want to try to make uh, a framework in which Q numbers are fundamental. So I was wondering, so David Wallace yesterday gave this talk about the decoherent way, and he sort of made this point that, uh, for example, instruments are shot through with quantum language, so you can't really make a clear distinction between classical and quantum worlds, so to speak. But but that observation cuts both ways, right? Maybe it's true that your quantum language will be shot through with classical language as well, right? You can't ever, I mean, it seems plausible, especially given that the most popular way of coming up with quantum theories is to start with classical ones and quantizing them, that in a way we'll always have some residual classicality uh, in our theories. I was just curious how you thought about that. Yeah, I think that's a problem for quantum theory. It's a, uh, and, and as I try to argue, we don't really need that. We, we can do without some of these, well, at least we can do without the C number time. And it, it I mean, not doing that would violate this principle that I say is the fundamental principle of quantum theory that physical systems are described by Q numbers. And if you don't adhere to that, uh, then what, what is this C number time? What, what is it doing in your theory? Is it the, the, the scripture of a classical clock? And if so, why can't you couple the classical clock to another quantum system in such a way that the clock is also described by, or yeah, it, it uh, has Q number descriptors. This is, as I understand it, the, uh, the totalitarian property of, of quantum theory that if you have classical systems, then they should be able to couple to, to quantum systems and, and gain quantum properties. So it just, I mean, in general, I think we should want to take quantum theory seriously. And in a specific case here, I think that there should be an explanation for what the C number time is in terms of something physical. And, and as I said, I, I think we have such a description. It's, it's basically the page Wooders formalism. And, and I uh, wanted to translate it into the Heisenberg picture. Okay, I'd have to think more about that. But the main, but your main point is that it's about this, it's this coupling argument is that if you have classical degrees of freedom in your theory, then in a way you must be able to come up with quantum, uh, quantum effects of them because they couple with quantum systems. Okay, that's interesting. I have to think more about that. Thanks. Thanks for your question. Yes. Simon, would you like to ask your question? Yes, indeed. Hi, Sam. Thanks for that talk. Hi. Really interesting. Um, and just a couple of comment or questions, really. I mean, one is, if you find the presence of the C number T in quantum theory peculiar, what do you think about the presence of the C number X in relativistic quantum field theory? Yeah, I think it's it's equally mysterious. Um, and <laughs> sorry. Well, and it makes me smile a little bit because what one might have thought it's the most secure bit of quantum field theory that we think we understand that it's operator mm -hmm. valued fields on space time. So to, to find the space time mysterious, I, yes. I, I mean, it's one thing to find the T parameter mysterious when you've got a, um, a an X operator, position operator, but when you lose the position operator in relativistic quantum field theory, it seems to be less concerned about any asymmetry, but yeah, the, that for me seems strange because we want space time to be a, f a physical system. I'm not, um, I kind of in this research, I've been pushed to the limits of my understandings of, of general relativity. But the way that I understand general relativity at the moment is well, space time is, is a physical thing, it can bend, it, it has uh, physical attributes, and, and how are we, how are we going to model a theory in which matter uh, can interact with this uh, classical space-time if, if they're described by different uh, 
well, if, if one is described by Q numbers and the other is described by C numbers, then doesn't the totalitarian principle hold there too? And um, it, and also, yeah, it, it, if you take the page with problem seriously, then I, I think that the problem becomes worse, not, not better if you move to uh, quantum field theory where you have this, this C number space time background. And I, th I think that was in fact, one of the motivations for Singh to formulate the page Wooders construction in such a way that it also incorporates space. I mean, I do take the point that this is a part of a, a wider explorative project to do something different in quantum gravity, absolutely. I mean, but can I just another quick question? Yeah, I mean, yeah, of course, yeah. I was a bit puzzled by the canonical commutation relationship that you wrote down between the time operator and uh, H, I think it was Hamiltonian. Um, and you also were speaking of eigenstates of those operators. So I was just wondering how, how that was possible. And normally, I mean, that's what always blocked use of the time operator in conventional quantum mechanics is the Hamiltonian being bounded below and with a point spectrum. So it can't possibly satisfy the canonical commutation relationship. Right, you mean, how do we just have uh, finite physical systems that can still represent clocks and we have... Uh... Well, have right, if they have eigenstates because sandwich the eigenstates, mm -hmm. the, com the, com the, com the, com the commutator by the eigenstates in question and then you've got a contradiction. Yes, so the way, I hope I'm understanding your question correctly, but the way I think about this is, for example, you, you might use a qubit and its eigenstates as an imperfect clock where you have not a uh, projective value measure, but you have some kind of P of VM defined in terms of uh, the, the qubits. Um, it wouldn't be eigenstates, but you can, you can construct some kind of P of VM with the, the qubit. And then uh, using the P of VM, you, you can create an imperfect clock and, and systems then evolve relatively to this imperfect clock. And the qubit has, if it has an Hamiltonian, the, the Hamiltonian will be very well behaved. It will be bounded from below. And uh, as I hope to show in the paper, uh, you, you can do the same, the same construction will hold in finite cases. You can define Q number functions in terms of uh, Q number, the, the descriptors of, of say a qubit, and, and then it also allows you to, to define derivatives and such things. Um, and then I, I kind of relied on the, the algebra of uh, finite dimensional angle operators. Um, but that's, again, this is part of the, uh, the ongoing work. Um, and just one other thought, well, thank you for that. So the one other thought is, um, and you did mention Dirac's early work. Uh, I mean, there's a very long unpublished manuscript of his on Q numbers. Have you ah. come across it or heard of it? It's, um, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, I never really got to the bottom of it. I think I may have a photocopy. I, I, it's in the I think Churchill College um, archive, I think. So anyway, just yeah, I, I didn't know about that. Um, it's only recently that Charles sent me this article by Dirac showing that he was talking about something like derivatives with respect to Q numbers, and I was very surprised by that. So I'm all, I am curious what he thinks about this. I haven't uh, read into it. Well, I haven't been able to fully explore the literature that he produced on that. Yeah, I mean, Derek Gold's book might be quite helpful. You know, from C numbers to Q numbers. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yeah. I've yeah. come across that one. Yes. Thanks very much for the questions. Thanks. Uh, there's there's a couple of minutes left. Lev, would you like to ask uh, your question? It's uh, maybe very naive. Uh, you know, I uh, a long time ago I had this idea that. Uh, the VI in energy eigenstate, uh, which was kind of very strange for me because I, I explain everything which I see around evolution, which were not an energy eigenstate when we need all different energies to, to explain evolution. So I looked on this uh, idea and uh, I found that uh, yes, it, it is consistent. We can uh, reproduce uh, what we see around and we, uh, even if we, we're in an energy eigenstate. But um, what I looked at least, it was much more difficult. Mm. And uh, so some people say, Wheeler, the wheat, whatever gravity uh, we need, well, we cannot have a superposition of different energies. So is this is the reason that uh, because of gravity, if we will not have any kind of, uh, if it, 
the assumption that the energy eigenstate uh, of the universe, okay, it's a possibility, but make a description much more complicated. Do we have a very serious reasons to believe that this is true? And this is why we do all these exercises or I don't understand something. So you mean, why are we assuming that the universe is in an energy eigenstate? Is, is that the condensed form of the question or am I misunderstanding it? The do, yes, so what is your reason or what, you know? Well, so my, I think the reason I like the page Reuters model is because it, it explains what time and change are in, in terms of things that are physical. Uh, so I, I don't, again, I don't really know what time would be, what the scene over time would represent if uh, it, you can't relate it to attributes of physical systems. And in quantum theory, that means you have to talk about some kind of quantum mechanical clock, I think. So you, you don't like that uh, we have parameter in chain regression. You don't, you think something wrong in this quantum mechanics. T is, T is not an operator, T is a parameter. And you know, this is what I, what, I, this is what I learned, this is what I know, and uh, what's wrong with it? This is very nice for me. Yeah, so I, I don't think we should accept it so uncritically. I think we should want to have an explanation for what the C number time really is in quantum theory. And why, if we have uh, these principles, uh, why is time something physical? Why, uh, yeah, what, what are we talking about when we're talking about the C number time? And I, I related it to this problem of absolute time in Newtonian mechanics, because I think it's basically the same problem. It's you have an object in your theory that is is unphysical, and uh, the yeah the relationist move is to say well time emerges from the change from the relative change between systems and in quantum theory the way to do that is by saying well time emerges from the relative rate of change between a clock and other and the rest of the, the universe. So for me that's that's the motivation. It's just we. We want to understand time in a way that's physical without uh, having the si having similar problems that we used to have with Newton's absolute time. Just what is what is your definition of physical? Well, in this case, it would be like what attribute of a physical system is, or, or how is the C number time related to the behavior of physical systems? What, uh, as I said at the beginning, like. Could it be that we just uh, that millions of years just passed by, and we we would never find out, we would never know, um, and and how in special relativity do we and, and general relativity do we make sense of that? How how can we treat space time as uh, something with physical significance if we say well in, in quantum theory uh, the the C number time is unphysical. So just maybe I repeat my main question. Is it related to general relativity or even without general relativity, without gravity, you have reasons uh, you don't like the T. T it's evolution. There is, a, there is a story, Psi of T, this is the whole universe for me. And it change, there are, there are changes. T tells how it's changed. You, um, th this picture is kind of, not, not well, yeah, so I think there's various motivations. What, so one of them is uh, in general relativity. I don't know quite how to make sense of space time being physical. Uh, also just what is, as I said before, what, what is the C number time? And, it, and somewhat more basic in a way is, um, or more fundamental for me is, I want to have an understanding of what these Q numbers are in the Heisenberg picture. In, so, the, in some sense, this is going off of criticisms that you have provided to the Heisenberg picture where the, the Q numbers, I don't think, I think you don't consider the Q numbers as being fundamental entities in the theory. They're, they're of the kind of, um, and, and I, part of the reason why I worked on this was because I thought, well, there should be at least uh, an alternative description in which you can start with the Q numbers and you can take them uh, as seriously as possible. And then from those, uh, you derive a, a theory that contains C numbers. So, it's kind of a defense against the, the attack that the Q numbers aren't fundamental. It's, it's, it's trying to propose an alternative model of quantum theory where you have as the fundamental entities, 
the q numbers so and, and i think in fact that's something that you uh, you often recommend that there should be alternatives to your view of the wave function being fundamental uh, so that that is that that was in the back of my mind when i when i was doing this research that there should be kind of an alternative story for those people who really like or, and think that the heisenberg picture is important that would be a perfect place yeah. to to stop and congratulate Sam once again. Thank you, Sam, for the nice talk. <laughs>